Production funding is provided by A. Reddix and Associates Health Information Resource Center, offering short-term training for long-term professional careers in medical coding. HIRCVA.net. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African American community. This is another view. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. The statistics are startling. One out of every 325 African Americans in Virginia lives with sickle cell disease. And of that group, 49% live right here in Hampton Roads. Virginia has an 8% higher rate than the national average of those living with sickle cell. So the question is why? Here with some answers is Shirley Taylor, social worker with Sickle Cell Association. A genius, a Janice Whaley, who is living with the disease, Karen Wilson, mother of two children with sickle cell, and Dr. William Owen, oncologist and pediatric blood disease specialist with CHKD. Welcome to another view, everybody. I'm going to get your name right. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. But I'm going to start with you, um, Dr. Owen. What is sickle cell? Sickle cell disease is a, a process where you inherit from your parents uh, a trait uh, for abnormal hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a part of the red blood cell that carries oxygen in the blood and is important for all our bodily functions. And uh, there are certain abnormalities in the hemoglobin structure that can result in abnormal red blood cell shape. And so, because the cell, the cell is usually round. It's, this, yes, the cell if is it's normal. It's normally round, okay. kind of a donut shape with a okay. hole in the center. Mm -hmm. And in the case of sickle cell disease, because of this abnormal hemoglobin, which interacts in an abnormal fashion with the outside of the red blood cell, you can get in times of stress sickling or sickle-shaped red blood cells, which causes a lot of problem. And you also have breakdown of these red blood cells very readily, causing anemia. Mm -hmm. and that's, so, what are some of the things besides anemia that happens to a person? who has sickle cell. What are some of the symptoms? The complications are, are very varied. Uh, the things that we hear the most about are painful events or painful crises. I like the word events better. Uh, these events occur because these cells become sickle shape. They go into the small blood vessels and they basically occlude those blood vessels, block the blood vessels, and downstream you don't get any oxygen. It's very much like mm -hmm. the, the idea of a heart attack where you get decreased blood flow to the heart muscle in that situation. Here this can be anywhere in the body where you get decreased blood flow. Uh, Janice, you live with this disease? Yes. Every day? Every day. When were you diagnosed and, and how? tell us about some of the things you've experienced. Well, I was diagnosed when I was seven. I was in the second grade and I missed the whole year of school. I got retained and um, the whole thing was I was ill and when my mother took me to the hospital they found out that I had double pneumonia and but they said there was something funny with my blood because they hadn't seen anything like that before. And they told my mother had she waited another hour, I would have been dead. But on top of the ammonia was this sickle cell that they said my blood was something wrong and they had to go back to their books to check. After they came back and they checked, they told her that um, I indeed had sickle cell and there was nothing that they could do for me at that time. But what they would do was treat me for the double pneumonia that I had that was already killing me and then they would send me to the blood specialist, I had to see a number of blood specialists um, after I was released from the hospital and I was able to get back into the swing of things like going back to school. Can you give us a sense, what year was that? Because I'm trying to, to go, I'm not trying to put your age out there, I, I hear you, but, but I really wanted, want to talk about you know, what was known and available then versus where we are I would say today. that was in the mid-60s. Mid-60s, mid okay. Mid-60s, yeah. Okay. So, um, so you were not tested or, or they, you did not know, your family did not know prior to your no. seventh birthday? No. I've never, they, what they told me was that my sickle cell was in dormant and that by having the double pneumonia and getting so weak that my immune system was non-existent anymore and that that triggered mm -hmm. the sickle cell in my in my body and then after they went ahead and you know healed me for this uh, for the pneumonia then I had to go to a variety of different doctors mm -hmm. uh, hematologists and um, while I was in the hospital for the pneumonia a nurse told my mother how to build up my resistance because every year I was back in the hospital, every year. And I, did things change as you became an adult? Did the symptoms the, lessen or, or get worse? The symptoms doesn't le didn't lessen, but what happened was, okay, well, yes, the symptoms did. <laughs> 
they did lessen, mm -hmm. but they became more intense. So I'm having less crisis, but when I do have one, I might as well have had one once a month or twice a month because the intensity was so bad. Mm -hmm. Mm. Just please, just shoot me. Do anything to make the pain. The whole thing, when you have a crisis and it's that intense as anything, do anything to make the pain stop. Just make the pain stop. And for some people, it depends on how long that crisis is. Mm -hmm. Some people, they have their crisis for a couple of hours. Mine would last me a couple of weeks. I'd be in crisis for a week and a half. Mm. So I'm out of school. As I get out older, I'm out of work. Not too many employers want you out of work a week and a half because you're having issues. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's, and even now, there are issues that are going on that I'm on disability now because they found out that um, I have hypoxia. Mm -hmm. um, they removed the gallbladder. They're just different things and things that I'm learning now that I got involved with the Sickle Cell Association that I, I went back to research. Um, it's kind of sad because you realize that in a sense, you're disintegrating from the inside out. Your body doesn't because get the, your body's not getting the oxygen right, in all the places. Right, your body's not getting the oxygen. Your body's not getting the nutrients. And then I learned that because of that, that your organs dry mm -hmm. up and die. You know, they disintegrate. Your bones do different things, and so it's now, a challenge. Karen, you have two daughters. Yes, I have two and daughters. And both of them have sickle yes. cell disease. Both diagnosed right? with SS, um, diagnosed at birth, because what was different now um, is that there's newborn screening. And so the sickle cell is one of the mandatory um, things that they check for. Mm -hmm. So at birth, um, they had the blood test. And um, a couple weeks later, you'll get something that will say you need to go and further um, check to see if the diagnosis is, is accurate. Mm -hmm. And so in both cases, um, it's interesting because they'll tell you that one in four of your children um, have the possibility of having it. And so I have um, four children, so um, two. Ah, oh, so two have. Yeah, both my daughters. And, and your hus you and your husband both had the trait, is yes. that right? Yes. Because, yes. Shirley, that's necessary in order for it to, to pass as the disease to a child that, that it has to come from each the parent having the trait. The father, mm -hmm. is no other, other way. Okay. So a lot of people don't understand that even if you're not married to the young man, if he has the trait and you have the trait, it's the possibility that you're going to have a child that has the disease. That's the way that it is. It's mm -hmm. a genetic disorder. Now, if you, if, you are, if you have the trait, my daughter has the trait, for example, um, but does not have a child with someone else who does not have the trait. What, what, is there still no, a chance? They, they will not have a child with a sickle cell disease. Okay. The father has to have the trait. Okay. What kind of services do you all offer then to help people? I'm listening to, to you talk about the not being able to work and, and, and so forth. What can people do to try to live with this disease? It's all about public awareness. And it's all about the class knowing about what's going on with their bodies. Uh, I talk to a lot of teenagers, and when I talk to them, and I'll say, uh, if you are sexually promiscuous, have you shared this with the young man? Most of them will say no. And I'll say why they are afraid that he may go away. But I'm saying that it's so important because if by chance you get pregnant, there's a strong possibility your child will be born with the sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. My role as a social worker, I have no problem with sharing this. I've been on board for three years this, this month. And when I came on board, I, like so many others in the community, knew nothing about the sickle cell disease. Today, I feel ashamed that I didn't. I should have researched. I should have went out and found out information on my own. But today, that's what I do every day is to go out and make the public aware that sickle cell is alive and is here. I have close to or over a little over 200 clients that I service. I service all of the Hampton Roads area as the social worker. Mm -hmm. I service Alloway County, Franklin, Suffolk, uh, Eastern Shore. I work two days at Eastern Virginia Medical School to do follow up with my clients that come from Franklin, Suffolk, uh, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the loneliness, the terror, that they fear inside because most of them, a lot of them are telling me that they don't even like to go to the emergency room because now they feel that they're being labeled. They're labeled that you're a drug addict. You're a drug addict because what are the medications that they are prescribed? It's heavy doses of drugs. And that's the yeah. only thing that can offset some of their pains. And so to feel that way, a lot of them stay home 
and don't even want to go to the hospital. After you shaking your head. <laughs> it is true. I've, I've experienced, I was sharing with Ms. Taylor on the way in about an experience that I had when I was on my way to the hospital. The ambulance came for me and the driver was stopping at red lights. I'm in the back thrashing from side to side mm -hmm. and you're stopping at lights. So I, you know, I asked the gentleman that was now, I said, please tell me this man is not stopping at all these red lights. So he said, he hit the driver and he said, well, I think you better put the siren on and go through. And then when I actually got to the hospital, I'm in pain, I'm crying. And the nurse says to me, <laughs> she says, um, you need to be quiet. You're in a hospital with sick patients. Hello? Mm. What am I? I came in on an ambulance. What did that make me? Mm -hmm. Why don't we have, why do we have such a small understanding, Dr. Owen, of this disease? I think there are a lot of reasons. I think uh, you've hit on some of them that even the people who have the disease or carry the trait, they don't have a, as good an understanding of the disease or the trait as they should. There is a kind of a culture of keeping this as a secret. Even some of our kids that we follow as they become teenagers, they don't want to let people know that they have sickle cell disease, where we advocate that they become educated and educate their peers about it. Um, it's a, a disease where these painful events, they're not like you have an, a broken bone where you can actually see something on your physical examination. Mm -hmm. you, a person can come in and have severe, severe pain into the emergency room and you do an exam on them and you don't find anything that you can see or that you can lay your hands on. And you have to go by what the patient's seeing, which is incredibly, imp or saying, which is incredibly important. You gotta mm -hmm. listen to the patient, but there's nothing physical that can say, I'm in this much pain or I'm in this much pain. You've got to you got to listen to the patient and and health care providers don't all understand that I know we have some statistics um, about sickle cell in this country uh, sickle cell affects approximately 72,000 people most of whose ancestors came from Africa and I want to talk about that in a minute um, the disease occurs um, in approximately one in every 500 African American births and one in 12 African Americans carry the sickle cell trait why is it a disease that seems to be so uh, prevalent within our community. It's not everyone. I mean, there are other people who are not African American who can develop sickle cell, right. correct? But right. but it's very prevalent in the African American community. Uh, and why locally? Is yeah, it, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of it is we have a lot of mil the military influence. We have a lot of. And I think that raises our statistics. We get a, a broad range of pe uh, people from all over the country who settle here in the Hampton Roads area. Mm -hmm. um, and again, being a genetic disease, if you have a pre higher prevalence in a certain area of the trait, then you're going to then you're going to find people you're going to have a higher prevalence of the disease the eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, so there there are several reasons for that to occur. Karen, when you and your husband were were thinking of having children, I mean, did you take that into Absolutely. account? Absolutely. Um, when we got married, he's my former former husband. Yeah. When um, we were starting to to court to court to date, <laughs> show my age. Um, we talked about sickle cell. I knew it was prevalent in my family. I have a very precious cousin, Rona, and um, I've, I've always been aware of the disease in my family. I have known I've had the trait. Um, mm -hmm. And anytime I was about to date, we would ask, we would have that conversation. Are you, you know, do, do you have sickle cell trait? Is it in your family? And in talking with um, my former husband at that mm -hmm. point, um, it wasn't in his family. He wasn't aware of it being in his family. I spoke with his mother. She wasn't aware that it was in her family. And mm -hmm. three weeks before we were to get married, we took a medical exam and found out that it was, that he did have the trait. And so we really had to talk about it. You know, what, what does this mean? Um, and because he knew it was such a, a major consideration for me, we decided, uh, do we call the wedding off? Do we still? But mm -hmm. I'll tell you, God is awesome. And he gives you everything you need to deal with whatever it is that you have. So and when your daughter's having, a t do they have, you call them crises, mm -hmm. right? That, um, or events, um, mm -hmm. as, as Dr. Owen said. What what do you do for them, first of all? And well, I mean, do they know if it's coming on or? Well, the, the, the protocol is that until they are five, um, my children, I think it's all the children, they take penicillin or um, some type of, of uh, something that would 
be able to deter any type of bacteria infection or disease. Yeah. Kind of so it's mm -hmm. an antibiotic and they take mm -hmm. it twice a day, every day until they're five. Um, they're on folic acid. We learn to check for the spleen. So every day you lay your child down and in the morning you're feeling around to see if there's an enlarged spleen. You look at the color of the skin and the eyes. So there's a whole different protocol that you do with children like that. Mm -hmm. um, when you travel, uh, you have a travel letter so that if you're someplace away from your hospital that if you do have to go into the emergency um, you have some some comparison they have some oh. numbers to be able to say well this is what the you know the the hemoglobin count usually is this is what the different you know the different mm -hmm. uh, qualifiers are and then they can do the blood test and see the differences um, when you when you have to present a child at an emergency room mm -hmm. and um, so you do kind of have an awareness they're very aware of what they can and can't do um, they are they haven't had any blood crisis or any um, pain crises or anything like that mm -hmm. um, the hospitalizations they've had because when you do have a disease like that um, if they have a fever of 101 or higher they're automatically we take them to the hospital and Dr. Owen has been our doctor for 13 years uh, my daughter the oldest mm -hmm. one is 13 and the youngest is seven and um, you know it's it's kind of a template that you follow um, but you know that you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just some things you've well, got Dr. to do. Well, Dr. Owen, and I'm going to ask you this of you also, right. Shirley. There's there's controversy right now with the um, uh, NCAA Correct. Uh, rulings in terms of all athletes, uh, student athletes, being tested right. now for sickle cell. Shirley, let me start with you. What are your your thoughts on that? Does that is that a good thing because we need to know, or does that cause more discrimination because it would be easier then for coaches to say, well, may, wait a minute, maybe this isn't the Person well, I, I want to have on my team. The only thing that I can see about that right at the top uh, mm -hmm. is that is it's good to be tested because if they're going to be out being involved with a athletic uh, uh, performance, they need to know if something is is wrong with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but before you leave the air today, I would like to make the public aware that the Sickle Cell Organization has joined for, uh, together with the uh, Be Sickle Smart, which is a national organization a program mm -hmm. that goes all around. Around the, the United States to enthuse and to inspire persons to, with sickle cell. That uh, we are going to have a uh, event on September the 18th at the Renaissance okay. Hotel. We are inviting sickle cell clients, uh, persons with the trait, and family members. Not open for the public because mm -hmm. it's going to be called a Sickle Cell Empowerment Day. So we are urging. So this is to empower the people who have yes, the disease. Yes, and so the families also can be aware of what's going on with their loved one. So mm -hmm. if anybody's interested in coming, they can feel free to call us at the sickle cell office and I can give you that number. Okay. Back to the right. NCAA for, for just a moment. Right. Um, exercise ex ex exacerbates, ex <laughs> I can't talk today, um, the symptoms? It can. It, it, it's really an inappropriate exercise. We encourage our, our kids to be active. Uh, I think okay. the NCAA ruling, it is definitely controversial. Uh, there are several reasons for that. It was it was, came about because of a lawsuit. Right, is the reason that uh, it mm -hmm. came about in the first place. Because a young man was was playing or practicing right practicing with uh, football and, and wound up dying right. on the field. Uh, right. So. The um, organizations that made the suggestion, they did not bring in all the different organizations that are involved with sickle cell disease. So I think that's part of the controversy. Okay. Um, also, now all children, as we have alluded to, are mm -hmm. tested for, for sickle cell disease at birth. So the testing is already done from kids born in the state of Virginia after 1989. Mm -hmm. uh, and in almost all states in the United States, that, mm -hmm. that information is available. So every child, every family should know the status of their, of their child. They should ask. Sometimes it doesn't get back to the family. Sometimes the information doesn't get back, but they should already have that information. So the testing is already there. We've um, only got about a minute left. Sure. Can you grow out of it? Well, once you have no. it, you have it. You're born with sickle cell disease and you have it all your life. So, so it really is something you live with, isn't it? You live with it every single day. If you could give a piece of advice to someone who is living with the disease now to keep them going because you look beautiful I mean looking at you you can't tell <laughs> thank that you there's, that there's anything going on I would tell them to be strong I mean it's, it's not something that's easy to live with but be strong because you can get through it and surround yourself with people who love you and care about you and above all find doctors who actually care that's mm -hmm. that's one of the ones I would say find doctors who actually because if you have a doctor that doesn't care it's like Ms. Taylor said, you're not going to the hospital. 
That's what I would tell them. Okay. And Karen, if parents are find out they both have the trait, they, they really need to talk about? They do. And we're not telling people not to have children. We're just trying to tell people to become informed, know what some of the decisions are, the consequences that can be resulting from that. And then once you do have a child, if that child does have sickle cell disease or if that child has sickle cell trait, share your family medical history. Mm -hmm. You've got to share that history because when people have the trait, they have somewhat of a relief and they don't share that information. So as the child gets older, they're dating, they're, they're marrying, they're having children, and they don't know they and have they the trait the until it's manifested yeah. in a child. Thank you all so much. This is fascinating, and, and I hope this starts the ball rolling in terms Thank of you. our community really talking about sickle cell because at one point we talked about it a lot and then it kind of went away, and, and we need to continue that conversation. Thanks so much for joining me today. And when we come back, some entrepreneurial high school students help businesses go green. But first, here's what's happening in Hampton Roads. All our stuff together that we're working on and view it. Welcome back. One local company is utilizing the skills of teens to help it go green. It's called the Start Program. And as our Lisa Godley found out, not only does it give the company a great start on reducing paper, but it gives its young participants a wonderful start to a career in business. So this is our start presentation of what we want to change in the office over the summer while we're working here. If you're thinking that some of the faces in this conference room seem a little young for corporate America, you're right. But the ideas these young minds are sharing with their co-workers will help one Norfolk-based company go green. And to reduce electronic waste, we can start recycling empty ink cartridges, unused cell phones, and old computers. This is the first year healthcare management consulting company A. Redickson Associates has instituted the summer internship program known as START. START is an acronym for Smart Students Accepting Responsibility Today. The START program not only allows this office to go green faster, but it gives the students valuable experience that they can take with them for the rest of their lives. We have styrofoam cups here that we have a, a water machine so instead of using cup after cup after cup, they suggested bring your own cups and just reuse that same cup. They suggested turning lights off when you're exiting the room. So they also suggested paper um, instead of using notepads to use scrap paper. The firm partnered with the city of Norfolk to select interns, but they come from all over Hampton Roads. When these teens aren't putting their go green suggestions to practice, they're working on several different assigned tasks to help A. Redickson Associates protect the environment. Kelsey Vanderhall is a rising senior at Lake Taylor High School, and right now she's creating a spreadsheet of local doctor's offices. Kelsey's job is to fax these businesses flyers about medical coding classes the company offers. Well, it's electronic, so it's not, you know, we're not printing out a bunch of flyers and, you know, either taking them to the offices directly or faxing them there, so it saves paper. I'm converting from physical paper to electronic, so we're trying to save paper and they don't have to look through this whole binder and try to find one little thing they could pull it up on the computer go in the folder and pick it. It's an eight-week program and they work about 30 hours a week. We believe that obviously they are the future so if we can teach them basic workforce development skills everything from project management to time management to uh, you know accountability a uh, responsibility um, being reporting to someone who has expectations and meeting deadlines. Um, those are skills that everybody needs to be successful in the workplace. We're just allowing them to see it and then actually experience it a little in, in hopes that we can help encourage um, you know, strong workforce or, or stronger students that will be ready to move into the workforce. I've learned that it's important to, to stay focused 
you can get sidetracked easily, but as long as you put your mind to it, you can you can do what you try to accomplish. Company president and CEO Angela Reddick says the program was created out of a need. So we've been able to bring these youth into uh, the business environment in an area where uh, there is a need for us to convert all of this paper to electronics. So number one, economically, it made sense to bring in inter interns to do it, and this is a paid internship program. Um, so we bring them in, we train them on project management so that we don't have to have our project staff so involved so they can continue to do what they need to do. While these teens focused on going green, Reddix plans to center on something different with next year's group. But one thing is certain, both the company and the teens will learn something new and the region will be better for it. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. And in full disclosure, A. Reddix and Associates is a production funder for Another View, and we thank them for their support. And we thank you for joining us today. We invite you to visit anotherview.tv and sign up for our eView newsletter. And we're on Facebook, so become a fan. Next week, tracing your roots through the arts and technology. We'll see you next time for Another View. Production funding is provided by A. Reddix and Associates, Health Information Resource Center, offering short-term training for long-term professional careers in medical coding, hircva.net.